Hello, travelers. Welcome to Oceans Week at Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens. This week, in partnership with the Explorers Club and in collaboration with ocean advocates around the world, we're sharing kid-friendly stories of ocean exploration, conservation, and wonder with members of our global community. You can find a complete calendar of live stream events and much more at athome.reachtheworld.org. Let's get, let's get things started today by diving into the worlds of marine biology and art. I'm happy to welcome Explorers Club member and PhD student, Brooke Fitzwater, who's gonna tell us how marine biologists tap their artistic side to aid their research and promote marine conservation. We're joined today by a few brave on-camera students, as well as a great live stream audience. If you're watching the live stream, please use the YouTube chat bar to let us know where you're watching from and what grade you're in. You can also share your questions for Brooke in the YouTube chat bar and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. So without any further delay, let's dive right in. Brooke Fitzwater, welcome to Reach the World. Hi everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. So I'm really excited to talk about the art of marine biology today. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over my screen. So let's do this. Here we go. I'm going to start my slideshow. Oh no, it skipped. All right. So we're going to be learning about the art of marine biology, as we've said. So first, before we get started, I want you to think, okay? So I need everybody to close their eyes, all right? Get them closed, get them closed. I'm looking, <laughs> I don't see them all closed yet. All right, they're all closed. So I want you to think, imagine someone who is a marine biologist. Close your eyes real hard and think about it. What do they look like? What are they wearing? What are they doing? All right, now I want you to do the same thing. Keep your eyes closed, okay? And I want you to imagine an artist, okay? So what are they wearing? What do you see them doing? All right, you can open your eyes now. So did those two people look pretty different to you? Did they look the same maybe? What were things that they shared? What do you think were things that were different about them? Do you think that maybe they could be the same person? Surprise, they can be. So guess what? I do all of the things. So I am a marine biologist. So the picture, right, let me see if my mouse is active. It's not. But the picture with all of the dive gear on, that's me in Chile with all of my dive gear on. Then the picture in the middle is just kind of an artsy photo because I do photography. That's me and my rabbit, Juniper. He's a good little boy. He's a good model. And then just for funsies, just to show you that marine biologists can do all kinds of cool stuff besides marine biology. There's me with my lightsaber. So I started learning how to do lightsaber spinning and I can spin that staff. It's pretty hard, but it's really fun. You just have to do a lot of practice. So marine biologists can be a lot of different things and marine scientists, okay? So it's a little bit different than marine biologists. They might study like how waves work. Maybe they study ocean canyons, okay? They can use art as well. But we're gonna focus a little more on marine biology because that's who I am and I know a lot about marine biology. So I do both research and I do art. And you can actually do both at the same time. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, you can't do both of those things. I'm here to tell you, you can, and I'm gonna show you why. So you can do all of the cool research stuff. So I have been to Chile multiple times. I love Chile. It's such a cool place. It's also cool in the sense that it's really, really cold. That water is so cold. Now this water right here, this is Easter Island. That water was not cold. It was really nice actually, it was a good temperature, but that was a really cool place to dive. So Easter Island is actually the place where they have all of those Moai head statues. Maybe you've seen those, okay? So that's what's over there. So I was diving there with my team, the lab that I was a part of, and we were looking for different things. We were looking at corals, we were looking at sea urchins. It was super cool. And then I've done a lot of different research projects. So this right here, you're probably like, what is that? 
it's just a little snail. They're about this big, okay? We call them tegula. These little snails live in kelp forest, okay? So you might not know what a kelp forest is. A kelp forest, maybe you've seen those pictures from California where they have those big underwater plants. They're not actually plants, they're algae, okay? So these guys live in those places, but sometimes they go and they eat all of the kelp and we don't really know why so we think that it might be due to predators and so if they're eating some algae on the ground and then there's a bunch of predators that want to eat them they're like mm, i don't want to do this so they'll climb right up into the algae and eat it so that's a potential thing that we think we're working on that publication right now so what we did is we had all of these boxes. So sometimes you got to get creative because you don't have enough glass tanks. So we use these plastic containers. We reuse them multiple times. So that way it was more eco friendly. So we would have this guy right here as a sea star. We would have our predator in there and then we would have the snail in here and we would just see how do these snails react to different predators. Now that sounds pretty cool and it sounds kind of easy, maybe, but what if I told you? We spent 24 hours and 48 hours doing this each hour without sleeping. That was wild. I don't recommend you do that, but for science, you can do it. So we would see how they would react each hour and we would go and check them. We had these little red lights and we would go at night. It was kind of cool though at night, you could see all of the ocean at night and the moon on it, it was really pretty. We also did something called tethering. So basically here's a brick. Okay, and I want you to imagine me. Okay, and I'm a fairly shorter individual. Okay, and I have all of these bricks and I'm crawling along the bottom of the ocean with these bricks. And there were a ton of them too. And so we'd have to go and we'd place them. And so we have the snails attached to it. And basically we would put them there and then we would leave. Okay, we'd leave for a couple of days and then we'd come back and we'd see, is the snail still there? or is it gone? So if it's gone, somebody probably ate it. So that just helps us to see who's eating what. But I've also done a lot of research with fish because I love fish. Fish are my favorite animal in the whole wide world. I love fish. So I did a project with this little guy. Now I know this looks crazy. Don't worry, we weren't stabbing him. He's okay, he's fine. What we did is we put these little pinpricks, okay, all around just to make sure that we could see the different morphology. That's a really big word. What does that mean? It just means the shape of the fish, okay? So that just helped us to see little points, okay? And then what I did is I was studying habitat preference. That just means where do they like to live? And does that change if they're with a predator? So it's really hard to see in the picture, but if you can see the circular pool, okay? There is a big fish, and a very little fish that could be very hard to see. But when the big fish would move, little fish was like, nope, I'm out of here. And so it would immediately go and pick somewhere to live. Now, you might have noticed the adorable little guy right over here in the right hand corner. He kind of looks like he's smiling and it may not be a he. This is the fish I'm going to study for my PhD. So a PhD is basically when you go to school for quite some time, so I'll be in school for five more years, and you get to study something that really interests you and you do your thesis on it. So the fish that I will be studying when I start my PhD this fall very soon is the mangrove rivulus fish. They're super cool. And you wanna know why? They don't have any females at all. There's no females. Can you imagine a world without women? So in these fish, they don't have any females. They either have just a couple males or they have ones that are boys and girls at the same time. So I'm gonna be studying how they relate with one another and how they pick mates because it's such a weird situation. They also live in mangroves as their name suggests. So we're gonna do research in Southern Florida, in the Florida Keys, and we're gonna do research hopefully in Belize, depending on, you know, the current situation. So these fish live in mangroves and mangroves are really important. They're very important to our marine ecosystems, our marine environments, because they provide a lot of habitat. They help with controlling things 
like the conditions of the water for the animals that live in them, they're very important and they have a lot of oxygen that they produce too. So we're gonna be studying this little guy and how it relates to its environment. So I'm gonna skip now. So that's all of the cool research stuff I've done. And now here's all the art stuff that I've done. So there's all kinds of art things that you can do. There's no one right way to do it. And just because I don't do it, doesn't mean that somebody else out there hasn't been doing it. So the first thing here is a lot of people that are marine bio artists or marine science artists are photographers because photography is really important. Let's say that there's an animal that nobody has ever seen before. Maybe you're diving somewhere off the coast of Maine, for example, and you see something that nobody's ever seen before. What would happen if you don't have a camera? You're not gonna get to photograph the thing that you're seeing, and then maybe nobody's gonna know about it. So photography is actually really important. So over here on the left hand of the screen, all of these are film photos. So that just means I took it with one of those old school cameras that your parents used to use, where you have to load the film in there. It's a little bit tricky because guess what? You can't see the photo after you take it. So imagine you just took a whole roll of photos and you don't know what they look like. So that's actually the fun part. So when you get it back from the lab, it's like Christmas. So I have taken several photographs. So these are all corals right up here. I loved the corals in Easter Island, Rapa Nui. They were so cool. And then this is also in Chile. And I did a really cool portrait series where you can do something called double exposure, where you take one photograph and then you can take another photograph on top of the one that you just did and it has really cool effects. So these are all marine scientists right here that I met in Chile. And then over here is all digital stuff on your right. So that first one is a cool green sea turtle that I met when I was in Easter Island, Rapa Nui. They call it Rapa Nui is the actual name of the island. So that's what I'm gonna call it. And then the crab and the sea star were animals that I used during my research. So I'm actually going to have those in my paper. So see, it pays off if you can photograph. And then there's a cool bird right there that I saw in Chile. And then a long exposure at the bottom. And then there's some of my friends diving. That was when we were doing a dive. So photography is pretty useful. It's a very useful tool when you're a marine biologist because it helps you to capture the things that you see so you can share it with other people, either scientists or just people that aren't marine biologists but want to learn about the ocean. I'm going to go to the next slide. The other way that you can use art is by using the art that most people think about, illustration, painting, drawing, all kinds of things. So there's so many options for you. I've done several different projects. So you might see all those animals up there. Those are all part of a book that I'm in the process of finishing right now. We're almost done. It's, it's very close to the end, but those are all animals that you find in Rapa Nui. And so the whole book is going to be about conservation of animals in Rapa Nui, what kind of animals they have there. And a lot of those animals are what we call endemic. That means they only live on that island. That's pretty cool, huh? I also have a, a pencil, or no, not a pencil, sorry, a pen drawing up at the top of those fish right there. They call those tipi tipi uri is the name in Rapa Nui. And then there's a green sea turtle at the bottom. And then I have some watercolor paintings. This was just for fun over here in the bottom left. And then there's a little sea otter. So if you paint, maybe you can include that in your research. If you have a research paper and you're talking about a certain animal so that way people know what you're talking about. You might see them a lot in textbooks. So drawings are really important in textbooks, especially if you're getting into the college classes that I was into and you need diagrams to see what the animal's build is like, what's on the inside of them. And you can use these to help do outreach like what I do. So art's really important. And then let me make sure the sound is off. It is not. Another thing that I use and that I have a lot of friends that use this and I know a lot of other people is they use, oh, let me put this back up, they use filmmaking. So basically having videos or video footage of animals to help show other people the world that we marine biologists get to see that you may not be able to all the time. So let me go ahead and play this first one. So I filmed this in the little aquarium. 
It's called Chiles Mar that they have at the research station. And I used a prism to make that super cool effect. Prisms are awesome. So they're this little glass bar and you can move it and it makes all kinds of cool effects. I use that in concert photography too. And then this is a sea slug. So they're related to snails. They just don't have the shell anymore, but they look pretty cool, huh? Look at all those little things sticking off of him. Pretty wild. There he is, he's just checking everything out. And then here's a segment of the film that I did for my last visit to Chile. And all the water there, there was so much water, it was so pretty. And then that's an Easter Island. And that's some kelp that I was talking to you about. Do you see the little shrimp? And there's a little crab. Those are some friends of mine. And that was a really cool beach called Matanzas. Look at those big boys and girls. And that's a fish market. So you wouldn't have seen those things if I hadn't filmed them. Filming is really, really important in making videos if you're a marine biologist, so that way you can share what you're seeing. All right. So those are all of the ways that I use art as a tool. But guess what? I'm not the only marine biology scientist or artist, excuse me, out there. There's a lot of different people. Oops, wrong thing. Hold on. Hold, please. There we go. There are a lot of us, and this isn't all of them. There's another slide. So some people, they use art, like what I do for illustration, okay? Some illustrators right here. This is a friend of mine from Chile, Idolo. They use a lot of illustration. Sarah, she actually makes music. She's a PhD student in Scotland. She uses music to help people hear humpback whale songs. How cool is that? Did you know that you could use music for marine biology? And then Gloria right here, she has all those little sketches I was talking to you about, like what they use in textbooks. And then look at Kyler's stuff. That's so cool, huh? She painted this octopus on a jacket. All right, so I'm gonna go to the next page. Here we are. This is my friend, Allie. Look at her photos. Do you recognize this one right here? So they have all these photos. Here's somebody else who does illustration Chloe and Annika. She does really cool illustrations. This is my friend Diego. He's also from Chile. Look at his cool photos. And then she has a little story, Emil or Emily. She has a little story about pebbles the or pebble, the turtle. And then here's a really cool octopus. And then these paintings on surfboards. What, you can paint on surfboards? So, there's a lot of diversity here, right? Look at all the different projects. Now, you might not have seen somebody that looks like you, okay? But just because you didn't see somebody that looks like you here doesn't mean that they're not out there. It just means that my Facebook post didn't reach them. But there's all kinds of different people who are marine biology artists or marine scientist artists. There's people out there who are making films. Maybe they use poetry. There are some people that are out there that use theater and they're all over the world. So just because you didn't see them here or doing a project that interests you or that really impassions you doesn't mean they're not out there and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. There's all kinds of different people with so many different skill sets and you're one of them. So you can do whatever you put your mind to as long as you're passionate about it, you can do it. All right. so. I have a challenge for you. Are you ready to accept my challenge? I can't hear you. Are you ready to accept my challenge? Yes. I knew it. Good. I knew you all were ready to accept the challenge. So what we're gonna do is this is the Marine Artist Challenge, okay? Now, normally I would tell you to go out to your local beach if you were able to do so. Right now, it's a bit of a different situation. You may not be able to do that safely, but there are options. One way that you can do this is you can go to an aquarium's website. So the Monterey Bay, for example, and they have live streams all the time 
and you can see different animals in different exhibits. So that's one way you can do it. Maybe you can watch a documentary. Maybe you can look up pictures on the internet. But what I want you to do is you're going to pick a marine animal or plant or algae, okay? And you're gonna call this your focal species. My what? What's a focal species? What? All that is, is it's just a fancy science way of saying, that's the species you're going to study. That's the animal you're gonna study. And that will be your focus, okay? So my focal species was the mangrove rivulus fish, okay? So you're gonna look up an animal. So maybe you're watching the Monterey Bay live stream Okay, and you see this really cool fish and you're like, I got to know what that is. And so you look it up and you find out what it is. Okay, then what you're going to do is I want you to learn just a couple facts about your new focal species. So maybe what does it eat? What does it do during the day? How does it live? Is it on the bottom of the ocean? Is it swimming towards the top? Does it live in tide pools? You got to figure all that out like the scientist that you are. All right. Now here's the fun part. Remember that I said that there's all kinds of ways to talk about marine biology and to share it using art and that there's different tools that you can use. You don't have to just use the things that I showed. Maybe you're really good at puppets and you can make a puppet theater about your animal or your plant. Maybe you can do a dance. I'm not very good at dancing, but you might be. Maybe you can have a dance about a crab. I don't know, it's up to you, okay? So you're going to use whatever art te uh, technique you would like. It might be a little hard to use filmmaking since you can't go out and see the things, but I'm sure you can figure out how to do it. All right. So go ahead, make your artwork. And then what you're going to do is I need you to share it with this hashtag. So hashtag EC Explorers Club times reach the world. So RTW Marine Artist Challenge. So you can share that on Twitter and Instagram, okay? And then you can find me, I am at Ocean Philly. I probably should have put it on here, oops. Um, I'm at Ocean Philly, so you can share it with me as well so I can see it. And I would love to share all of your artwork and I wanna see all of it. I wanna see it. I love seeing everybody's art. And I know that there are so many talented people out there and I wanna see just what you can do and if you're up for the challenge. So if you're up for the challenge, Make sure you tag this big long hashtag and let us see it. So for example, right here, here's Leptograpsus Vreogatus. That's the Spanish. Well, it's not, that's the scientific name, but that's how you would pronounce it with a Spanish accent. Um, so there he is. This little guy is from Rapa Nui. Okay. And then I painted it right here. And then I shared it on my Twitter and on my Instagram. So you're going to be just like a marine biologist artist right now when you share all of that. How cool is that? All right. So thank you all for joining me. And remember, there are going to be so many cool discussions and topics this week with Reach the World. You can also follow me on my Twitter and my Instagram, both at Ocean Philly. I'm doing Ocean Weeks programming all week long. So make sure you stay tuned to get even more information on the ocean. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Reach the World. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brooke. What a great presentation. Um, I have so many questions for you, but we also have so many students who are eager to, to talk to you and see you today. So I want to jump right to some of our great students who are joining us on camera today. And I'm going to go to Kate first. I know we've got Finley and Calvin too. I'll come to you guys next, okay? Let's let Kate jump in and ask her question. Kate, go ahead. Have you ever discovered a new species? Have you ever discovered a new species you never have discovered if you weren't a marine biologist? I am so sorry, Kate. I could not hear you. Can you try that again? Have you ever discovered a new species you would never have discovered if you weren't a marine biologist? Okay. So I have not personally discovered a species, but I've seen animals that I never would have thought existed before. So even if it's not a discovery to the world, it's a discovery to you. And that's what's important, okay? So one of those things was actually a shark in Chile. They call this shark the Pinta Roja, okay? They're about, here we go, this long. I know that was not the best pose, but they're about this long, okay? And so the first week, 
that I was there during my last eight month visit. Believe me, I've been to Chile like four times. So we found all of these shark egg cases on the beach. And I was like, oh, these are really cool. And then we realized they were alive. So we got to bring them back and we raised them and then we got to return them to the wild. But before diving there, I hadn't really known too much about the Pinta Roja. And before finding them on the beach, I didn't know a lot about them. And I got to learn about them by just observing and looking around the beach and finding them. It was pretty cool. And then while I was diving in Easter Island, for example, I had to look around me. There was so much I had never seen before. It was so amazing. I had seen things I had only dreamed of seeing, things I didn't realize existed. It was so amazing. But it helped me to write and illustrate the book better because I didn't know that these animals existed until I saw them. I didn't know what everything looked like. So you can make your own discoveries by just going out and checking things out. Does that answer your question, Kate? Awesome. Awesome. Kate, thanks for such a great question. Uh, Finley, Calvin, I'll come over to you guys. You can decide who goes first. <laughs> okay, so what is the most recent discovery of a fish? or a new fish. Okay, so they discover a lot of different fish all the time. So I wouldn't be able to tell you the most recent discovery, but I do follow this really cool guy on Twitter. And unfortunately I just remember his first name. I don't remember his last name, um, but I think he's like coral reef fish something on, on Twitter. I can tweet that out. Um, but he's constantly doing these really really deep dives like I mean crazy deep like way deeper than I'd ever go okay like 400 feet and he finds all of these fish that are down there in the deep water because most people don't dive down there like I, I can't dive down there I don't have the training for it and my ears won't let me but he goes all the way down there and he finds all kinds of fish that are really really colorful that you would never expect to be down there that deep. So he's constantly just being like, hey, look at this cool fish we found, look at this one. But there's so many different fish that people are out there finding each and every day. I wouldn't be able to tell you the most recent because somebody might've found one today and we don't know about it yet. They have to publish it. All right, He's fantastic. also a marine artist too, he photographs. Great question. All right, let's take another question. Go ahead. I don't know if that was Finley or Calvin who asked the question, but let's go to the other guy. Um, um, have you ever seen a manta ray? And if so, where? I have not seen a manta ray while diving, but I saw one in an aquarium. So the Georgia Aquarium has them. They're so big. But one day I really, really want to see a manta ray while I'm scuba diving. That is one of my top dreams for sure. But they're huge when I saw them at the Georgia Aquarium. Like, think probably like three times bigger than you actually think it is. And they just kind of look like a giant flying carpet. It's so cool. I do have a friend though that she dove with whale sharks. Usually people put the whale sharks and the manta rays together because they're so big and people love to see those. But she dove with whale sharks and she was like, this is the best day of my whole life. So that'll be mine when I get to dive with either whale sharks or manta rays. Good question. Yeah, very good questions, Finley. Calvin, thank you so much. We have a question from Alex on the live stream. He's a third grader and he'd like to know, what is your life story of being a marine biologist? Hi, Alex. So that's, wow, that's a, let's see if I can make this short. So I have always loved the ocean. I have always been excited about marine biology. I used to beg my mom to take me to the aquarium all the time, so much so that she once said, I think I took you to the aquarium one too many times when you were little and this is what happened. That used to be my Twitter bio for the longest time. So we would go to the aquarium all the time when I was little and I used to just love to look at everything. I was like, I wanna be a scuba diver one day. And so for a while though, I thought about other different jobs and I was like, maybe I could like study this other animal or do this thing. Um, but when I was in eighth grade and starting ninth grade is when I figured out that I was like, you know what, I'm definitely gonna be a marine biologist. So I've wanted to be one for quite some time. Now, I didn't learn how to dive until 2017, which was pretty late in the game because it's, diving's kind of expensive, okay? Spoiler alert, it's really expensive. So I wasn't able to take the class and I had already been to Chile twice. And I hadn't been able to dive there yet. 
And then I started diving and that changed my life. I love scuba diving. You get to actually see all of those animals that you've learned about in textbooks or that you've seen in documentaries or in photos. And they're there right in front of you. And sometimes you'll just be diving and you'll be sitting there like this. And that fish is this close to you because they just don't really have a fear of people sometimes. Not all fish. It depends on the fish or the animal. But they'll just sit there and you can just sit there and watch it. And I was like this in Chile. And I was like, oh, there's a fish in front of me. It was amazing. And so I've been diving since 2017. So the past three years, it'll be my three year anniversary in August. And just so you all know, you don't have to live by the ocean to be a marine biologist. I have been living in Tennessee for quite some time since 2007. If you know your geography, Tennessee is not next to the ocean at all. We're not even close. It takes a really, really long time in a car to get there. And Chile is a really long flight. You have to take like a two hour flight to another state that can take you the eight hour trip to Chile. It's a long ways. And just to blow your minds, to get to Easter Island, it's a five hour plane trip across the ocean. That's how far away it is. So it was very weird sitting in that plane and going, wow, there's just water underneath me for a long, long time. It's crazy. So, oh, sorry about that sound. My bunny knocked all his food over. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's really awesome that you can still do things like marine biology while you're somewhere that's landlocked. Because I know a lot of people that they actually are marine biologists and they live in places like Arizona, which is a desert. They work at aquariums, for example, okay? And so I knew that I love marine biology, but I didn't live near the ocean, so I had to go to the ocean. So that's why I went to Chile so often. So I got a lot of funding from my undergraduate university. I got funding from Explorers Club. So that way I could go and do all this cool research, even though I didn't live by the ocean. And you can dive when you don't live by the ocean. I dive in something called a quarry. So basically it's this place where they take out a lot of rocks and it's kind of like a lake. Okay, or we call it the big nasty pond sometimes because it's a little nasty, but it's fine. Uh, there's a lot of algae growing in it. So it's basically they've hollowed out all the rocks and then some natural spring water comes up and fills it up like a lake. And so you just dive there. There's no waves. It's pretty chill. They got some fish there. You got to watch out for those fish because they bite. They're just regular old bluegills, but <laughs> one bit me on the lip once and that was not fun. But yeah, you can dive in freshwater. Surprise! So yeah, I guess that's my marine biology story. And before I forget, my marine biology story is starting a new chapter. Like we said earlier, I'm gonna go and get my PhD. So now I'm on the next phase of my marine biology journey and I'm really excited about it. Very cool. Great question from online. Thanks so much, Brooke. Um, Kate, I wanna come back to you if you have another question. If you don't, that's okay, but I wanna be sure to give you a chance to ask another one if you'd like. Have you ever uh, come across an animal you are afraid of? So, okay, I don't like really big sharks. Like, let me rephrase that. I have a healthy respect for really big sharks, okay? I get nervous around the idea of like great whites and such, like a lot of people do, but I respect them because they're really important to our ecosystems. And most of the time they don't want to bother you, okay? But I haven't encountered one of those big sharks yet. However, there was one time that I was diving, okay? And remember the Pinta Roja that I talked about earlier, that shark? I was in the process of taking the snails because we needed to collect them for my research. So I was taking them and paying attention to that. And the next thing I know, there's a shark right in front of my face. And like, I didn't know that it was there. So it scared me a little bit. So I was like, <gasps> and I like jumped back a little bit. I was like, what was that? And I looked around, I was like, <gasps> and I just saw the shark. I was like, oh, that's nothing. But it scared me a little bit because I didn't know what it was. And if you have something brush up against you and you don't know what's there, that is a little intimidating. But I haven't met anybody else that's bothered me. Great question, Kate. Thank you so much. Finley, Calvin, let's go back to you guys. If you have another question, go ahead and ask Brooke. Okay, so what is the most dangerous animal in the ocean? Okay, this is dependent on who you talk to. Okay, but there's a couple really dangerous animals in the ocean. The blue ringed octopus is super, super deadly. So we don't play with those, but those are in Australia. So if you don't live in Australia, you're probably safe. If you do live in Australia, if you see a little octopus, don't pick it up, okay? 
So when they get agitated, they have little blue rings. And so that will let you know, hey, hey, you're, you're bothering me. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. And so they actually have a really, really potent toxic um, venom in them that can hurt you. So we don't play with those, okay? The other thing is they have sea, or sea snakes. Those are really dangerous. Those can kill you. There are also box jellyfish that are really dangerous, okay? Oh. Yeah, so you have to watch out for those. But just because there's dangerous things in the ocean doesn't mean that we shouldn't go visit it. You just have to keep an eye and kind of see, okay, what's going on today? So like if you go to the beach, for example, and you see a purple flag, that means that there's dangerous marine life in the water and maybe you should stay out today, okay? But if you don't see it, that means that they haven't seen it, but you should still kind of keep an eye out, okay? Now, there's some that people think of as really dangerous like sharks and sharks, the big ones can be dangerous, but most of the time they don't really wanna mess with you. But if you're all up in their home, in their home space, if somebody came into your home, you might be like, uh, why are you here? Or you might have a case of mistaken identity. That's usually what happens, okay? So the big sharks are not as dangerous as you think they are, but you shouldn't go up and hug one. I wouldn't recommend that, okay? <laughs> but yeah, there are lots of dangerous animals in the ocean, but there's also lots of dangerous animals here on land. So it's about the same, because a lot of people really think, oh, the ocean's really scary and dangerous. But we have a lot of dangerous stuff here too, on the land with us. It's just that we're not used to the ocean ones. Well, Finlay, it sounds like it sounds like maybe the blue ring octopus would be a good focal species for Brooks yeah. Art Challenge because sounds colorful, sounds interesting. You could learn some cool facts about it without putting yourself in any sort of danger. Maybe yes. you want to take that one on for your art challenge. Um, let's go back. Sorry, Finley, Calvin, you guys will have to unmute. I want to take a question from Calvin. If uh, Calvin, if you have another question. Have you ever seen a predator either chase or eat a prey? Okay, so I have a cool story. I went diving um, with my friend Erasmo and Ali in Chile. Okay, we were looking for something called picorocos. They're basically these big barnacles. All right. And so we were looking around and we saw this weird thing happening. Okay. There was a shark, another shark and something called a hagfish, okay? Hagfish are weird. They're barely fish. They don't have a jaw, okay? And they make lots and lots of slime, okay? So it was a male shark and a female shark, okay? And they were in the process of kind of talking it out, right? They were fighting a little bit. And the hagfish was really excited because he thought that that meant it was mealtime. It was not mealtime, but he didn't get the memo. But he was kind of swimming around and he's like, what's going on? And he was looking everywhere. It was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I have also seen fish eat, like I fed them. It was so adorable. So the little fish that I showed you all earlier that I did my research on in Chile where we had the little pinpricks, okay? I would feed them something called amphipods. So we also call those sea fleas. They look like fleas, but they're in the ocean. They're not actual fleas, okay? And I would feed them all the little sea fleas. And what they would do would be so cute. They would go pew, pew. And they would come up to the surface and they would eat all the little sea fleas. And it was so adorable because they were so excited about it. Okay. And we would also feed the crabs. They would have little uh, snails that were about this big. Oh my. They would destroy those snail shells because they're really strong. Trust me. Okay. Don't learn, like learn from my mistakes. Okay. Don't repeat them. I have had one of those uh, crabs get me right here and it hurts so much. They have a really strong grip. So they're strong enough to shred those shells. So we would put them in there and you would just see them crunch all of those shells and there would just be little pieces everywhere. It was wild. So whenever you would go diving, you would just see all these little pieces of shells on the bottom and you're like, well, there was a crab here. So does that answer your question? All okay, right, great. Finley Calvin, great questions. Thank you so much. Brooke, I have a question from Alexander um, online um, as part of the, the live stream. He wants to know, have you ever been in a tough situation in the ocean that was hard to get out of and what did you do? Oh, <laughs> oh have I? There's There's been a couple. Um, so safety is the number one thing when you're scuba diving, okay? So we are always trying to be as safe as possible, okay? But there was 
there have been a couple times where we've been out and we were doing our research and the wind conditions got a little bit worse than they were when we were starting. And so we would have to turn back around because it would just get to be like so bad that you couldn't see or you're going like this. And it's like, yeah, no, we need to stop. So there was one time that we were out and we were searching for something and all of a sudden, like everything just picked up and it was like this. And I'm like, oh, we need to abort this dive. And like there was so much stuff everywhere and you couldn't really see. So we kind of came up a little bit and we were like, OK, so now we got to get back to shore. So we're trying to make our way back to the shore. OK, and so during these times, you have to be very calm. OK, and we were getting out before it was getting too bad, but it was still kind of rough to navigate. So you have to sit there and be like, even though you feel like, because if you do that, you can't breathe through your little regular mouthpiece. And I could probably go grab it in a sec if you want to see what it looks like. Um, but basically we had to go down towards the bottom. So the bottom usually has less current. And so we're kind of swimming along the bottom and trying to make our way back. So we get back up, okay? We're at shore. We're very, very close to it but the waves are really bad and you have all of your equipment on, okay? And you're trying to take all of it off and you're trying to get your fins off so that way you can get out and you're going like this and there's lots of rocks and you're like, oh. and so you just have to breathe. You always breathe through all of these and you kind of have to think with your head, okay, I have to stay nice and calm because if I panic, then I could have something really bad happen because I'm not thinking straight. So you think very clearly as possible or as clearly as you can and you just focus on your breathing. And so eventually we were able to hurry up and get out when the waves were a little bit more relaxed because there's different timing with waves. And so you'll have a lot of waves and then you'll have a period where it's a little bit more stable and that's when you get out. And so that's what we were doing. And so we did obviously make it out and everything was okay, but it was a little bit like, oh my, white knuckling it to get out. But that's why you got to learn from our mistakes. And we learned that you have to kind of watch the conditions. And if it's going to get a little bit worse, or you feel like, oh, I don't feel comfortable with this, you got to get out. Um, great answer, or great question. Great answer. Thank you, Brooke. Um, my, I have a question for you real quick, Brooke. So if you're, you're a marine biologist or an ocean uh, scientist and an artist, how do you get your camera underwater? If I put my camera underwater, I think it would like fizzle and die. What do you, what sort of uh, tools are available for artists underwater? Okay, so I currently use a GoPro, which I happen to have, and I have the case, okay? I use a GoPro for underwater and I use a DSLR, the big giant cameras, I don't have it with me, um, but the big giant cameras above water. So here's the GoPro, okay? And then here's the case. So you put it, let me actually get it in there. You put it in the case, okay? And then I seal it, if it'll seal today, okay? Now it's solidly in there. Now the newer GoPros, this is a newer one, okay? If you get it a little bit wet, it's fine. It can go down to 30 feet, but I always keep the case on it to protect it. Now, if you have the really big cameras like what I have, it's gonna fizzle out real fast. So what you do is you basically have a case like this, okay? So there was someone that I dove with in Easter Island. His name is John Whitman, Dr. John Whitman, okay? He's a professor. And so what he does is he has a really, like, I mean, enormous, basically a tank of a case, okay? No water is getting in that thing. And he treats it like his baby because it is his baby, all right? So he has all of that protection around his camera and he's got handles too. So that way he can kind of go down and he's holding it like this and you can turn and do all that. And it's nice and smooth. And he has lights on it. It's, it's a really fancy setup. This is not a fancy setup, okay? This is the beginner step. And then eventually I'll make it to the big fancy step. But I have a lot of friends that they do have this. And so you have your big case and that way the water doesn't get in. But you have to be really careful because I've had friends that have learned the hard way. If you do not seal this correctly, the water can leak in. So usually you test it right before you go diving because you don't want to be... 40 or 50 or 60 feet down and then your camera leaks because that's the end. So we always have to make sure, you know, everything's good, the seals are clean and that way we don't have any leaks. So that's how you do that. 
All right, great. Well, that's really good to know. Um, we are getting right up to the end of our time here. It's, time has flown by. It's been such an interesting and fun conversation. Um, Brooke, we're going to add to Reach the World social media channels that slide with your art challenge um, with the hashtags that you shared. So for any students who are watching us today or watching a recording after the fact, if you want to uh, have a reminder of what those hashtags are for submitting for Brooke's uh, art challenge, you can go check it out there. And I hope that we get lots of great uh, student submissions. It's a really fun, fun thing to work on. Thank you, Brooke, for bringing that up. Um, the last question that I wanted to sort of close with before we go, Brooke, can you just sort of tell us why um, in your mind it's important for kids in the U.S. to care about and be interested in and preserve our oceans? This is a really good question. It's one of my favorites. A lot of our life is super tied to the ocean. The ocean is way more important than you think. So a lot of our weather comes from the ocean, okay? And a lot of our food, the air that we breathe, a lot of people's livelihoods, so the money they make so they can feed their kids, comes from the ocean. And the ocean has so many awesome animals, just like you all have asked about, or maybe you've seen some cool animals before, if you've been to the beach or been to an aquarium or saw a documentary, there's so many cool animals and plants and we have to protect those. And so sometimes people are confused, like, well, why, why does that matter? Why do we need to protect these? So for example, if there's a fish that everybody loves to eat, okay? If you eat all of the babies and all of the adults, are you gonna have any more fish? No. So we conserve these animals, we protect them. So that way we can have more of them in the future because every animal or every plant that's in an ecosystem that's supposed to be there, that that's native, okay? They have a special role in that ecosystem. So maybe they provide food to other animals. Maybe they provide shelter. So for example, the kelp that we were talking about, if you take that kelp out of that ecosystem, if you rip it out, that's a loss of home, food, places to raise your kids, your fish kids, or maybe your crab kids, okay? They don't have that anymore. So they don't have anywhere to go. That's like if somebody said, oh, I'm taking your house out. It's the same thing. So that's why we have to conserve and protect our oceans to make sure that we have all of the life that we're supposed to have there in balance so that we can continue to have that life for years to come. All right, great, great answer. Um, we're gonna have to wrap things up there, unfortunately. Um, we're out of time. It was so much fun to talk to you today, Brooke. Before um, I sort of close things up, I wanna let Kate and Finley and Calvin unmute themselves, if you guys wouldn't mind, and I'll give you a chance to say goodbye and thank you to Brooke. Go ahead, thank guys. You. Thank Hi, you. it was nice to meet Bye. you all. Yeah, thank you all for joining us today. This has been so much fun, Brooke. Uh, thanks to our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us too. This is just the beginning of Reach the World's lineup of Oceans Week events. Later today, we're gonna be journeying down to the Titanic. And tomorrow we'll be taking a close up look at seashells and unlocking some of the secrets of the Galapagos Islands. So there's so much more to go this week. You can check out a complete list of upcoming Oceans Week events at athome.reachtheworld.org. And with that, I will see you all soon. Happy World Oceans Day, everyone. Happy World Oceans Day. Happy World Oceans Day.